people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Jaffrey with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi was on a three-day, three-nation European trip this week where he engaged with top leaders of Germany, France, Denmark and other Nordic countries. The visit primarily focused at deepening the multi-front cooperation between India and European countries. While Germany announced an advance commitment of 10 billion euros, France signaled it was looking forward to working with India on civil nuclear cooperation. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, along with key members of his cabinet, including Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jaisankar and Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman, held sixth India-Germany intergovernmental consultations last week. A total of nine agreements were signed between India and Germany. This included a joint declaration of intent on green and sustainable development partnership under which Germany agreed to make an advance commitment of 10 billion euros equivalent to 10.52 billion dollars of new and additional developmental assistance to India until 2030. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz expressed his confidence in the growth of Indian economy, which he said will hold key responsibility in the global fight against climate change. Angesichts der Bedeutung, die Indien haben wird wirtschaftlich und auch im Hinblick auf seine Bevölkerungsentwicklung, ist auch klar, dass im Hinblick auf den globalen Klimaschutz Indien ein Schlüsselland ist. Und das ist wichtig für die Zusammenarbeit, die wir in diesem Bereich entfalten. Deshalb bin ich sehr froh, dass wir eine ganze Reihe von Vereinbarungen haben abschließen können und insbesondere diejenige, die wir eben haben, unterzeichnen können. India has now been making inroads into the European market, with the latter being largely appreciative of Delhi's commitments towards achieving its ambitions in the past few years. While the European Commission President had last week paved the way for a better trade connectivity between the two sides by agreeing to establish a Trade and Technology Council, India and the European Union are set to hold an initial round of negotiations on a free trade agreement in June this year. As per different sources and reports, the two sides are looking to seal the deal by late 2023 or early 2024. हम एफटीए वार्ताओं में शीघ्र प्रतिबद्ध के प्रगति के लिए प्रतिबद्ध हैं भारत के कुशल कामगारों और प्रोफेशनल से the Ukraine-Russia war, which has had polarizing ripple effects in the past two months, was also one of the important discussions during PM Modi's entire visit. Modi reiterated Indian stance, urging the two countries to resort to dialogue and discussion. He said India was and will always watch for peace. While meeting his Danish counterpart Matej Fredriksson, Modi lauded her efforts on the green strategic partnership that both the countries share. Speaking about the mutual goals of Denmark and India, he mentioned the green strategic partnership that aims at further economic and political ties between the two nations and also nurturing budding job opportunities. Jinka 
डेनमार्क के मजबूत होते संबंधों को दिखाता है और खास बात यह है कि हमारी ग्रीन स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप प्रधानमंत्री फेडरेशन की व्यक्तिगत प्राथमिकताओं और उनकी वैल्यूज से गाइडेड है द प्राइम मिनिस्टर्स ऑल्सो प्लेज्ड टू कंटिन्यू टू डीपन कोऑपरेशन बिटवीन द नॉर्डिक कंट्रीज एंड इंडिया and focus their discussions extensively on international peace and security including the conflict in Ukraine and multilateral cooperation blue economy climate and sustainable development and multilateral cooperation in the context of covid aftermath were the key agendas of the nordic summit Narendra Modi received a grand welcome on his last leg of tour by the French president Emmanuel Macron. Macron has recently been re-elected the country's president. The ties between India and France have grown stronger with Delhi expanding its defense import destination. New Delhi has acquired 36 4.5th generation aircraft from France. While discussing the entire range of ties, the two sides have committed to deepen ties at multiple fronts, including the fight against climate change. Experts who have dubbed the Indo-French ties as a connection of hearts have said the relationship is only going to get stronger in coming times. Moving on, officials from World Food Program visited the Indian town of Amritsar from where the thousands of tons of wheat is being sent to Afghanistan. They heaped praise on the Indian government saying the assistance being sent by India was of premium quality. Meanwhile, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan has said that the humanitarian conditions were deteriorating rapidly in Afghanistan and the world needed to do more in order to prevent it from plunging into acute poverty. As India completed over 20% of its 50,000 metric ton target of wheat to be sent to Afghanistan, a team of officials from UN World Food Program visited a facility that procures, cleans and packages wheat for Afghanistan. The delegation from World Food Program visited the facility in northern Amritsar city and praised the work being performed at the facility. As part of humanitarian aid to the people of Afghanistan, India's wheat is being transported to the war-hit country via Pakistan's land route. As per different sources, the World Food Program officials were highly impressed the way wheat was being treated before being transported to Afghanistan, the country where the food insecurity has been rapidly climbing. there has been a partnership between wfp and government of india and we have the government of india is sending uh, wheat from the people of india to the people of afghanistan the first tranche is over we are now uh, sending the second tranche of 10000 metric ton india has so far sent 10000 metric tons of wheat to afghanistan In total, India plans to send 50,000 tons of wheat to Afghanistan on an infrequently used land route through Pakistan in a bid to help the country facing poverty and hunger since the takeover by the Taliban last year. We're here to um look at the operations and look at how the wheat's getting cleaned, how it's procured, cleaned and then how it's being shipped out. and it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, we're extremely impressed with the operation and all the hard work that's gone uh, into getting this wheat um out to the people of Afghanistan as a as a gift from the people of India Meanwhile the special inspector general for Afghanistan reconstruction Sigar in its latest report said that since the takeover of the Islamic Emirate in August 2021 Humanitarian conditions have deteriorated with over 24.4 million people in need of humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan an increase from 18.4 million in 2021 Sigar in a report to the US Congress said that 70% of the Afghans are unable to provide for their basic needs 
This comes as the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO of the United Nations said that 53 world countries including Afghanistan face acute hunger. Afghanistan has been suffering from drought in recent years, made worse by climate change, with low crop yields raising fears of serious food shortages. The international community is grappling with how to help the country of some 40 million people without benefiting the Taliban. As per Siga, the current humanitarian crisis in which 23 million or some 60% of the population are reliant on food aid is having a disproportionate impact on women and children. Moving on. Anti-government protests in Sri Lanka continued this week too, with opposition parties taking to streets against the Rajapaksas. The weeks-long economic crisis in the island nation is showing no signs of abetting with the resignation chorus demanding President Gotabaya Rajapaksa and his brother Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa growing by the day. The crisis has affected nearly everybody in the country, with people at the lower economic strata complaining of not being able to acquire even the everyday essentials. Sri Lankan streets witness thousands of people coming out of their homes to protest against Rajapaksa brothers as weeks-long economic crisis showed no signs of abating. Led by opposition leaders, they carried floats and placards reading, Gotta Go Home. Opposition parties ended a week-long march from the central city of Kandy with thousands of supporters thronging Colombo's Independence Square. Sajit Premadasa, chief of the Samagi Janabalavagaya party, addressed protesters telling the crowd that his party have taken a decision not to make any deals with the government. The island nation's economy has been in tatters for the past many weeks. The current foreign reserves that have come down to unprecedented lows have left people struggling to pay for fuel, food and medicine imports. And while many of the cabinet ministers resigned last month, taking responsibility for the failure, the Rajapaksa brothers have refused to take the road of stepping down. It has created an impasse with the demonstrators, saying they will not go back until their demands are met. Meanwhile, people continue to struggle. The inflation has skyrocketed and unemployment is growing widespread. Miles away from the capital, even the farmers and the plantation workers are severely hit. On a lush plantation in Sri Lanka, Arulappan deftly plucks the tips of each tea bush, throwing them over her shoulder into an open basket on her back. After a month of picking more than 18 kgs of such tea leaves each day, she and her husband receive about $80. She says that they are unable to meet their family expenses with the kind of money they are receiving now. Mm -hmm. 
එමදාම අපි තේක බීලා තමයි දින යන්නේ සීනිත් වෙඩි වල තියෙනවා රොටි කියලා ගන්න ගියොතම රොටි ගන්න බෑ රොටි දෙන් පාන් පිටි උඩ වෙලා මේ මිල කියලා තියෙනවා ඒ වගේ කියන්න ඕනේ මේ හාල් වලට මිල කියලා තියෙනවා එම එම එකට The tea industry, which supports hundreds of thousands of people, also suffered from a controversial government decision last year to ban chemical fertilizers as a health measure. First quarter tea production fell 15% on the year to its lowest since 2009, with the Sri Lanka Tea Board saying dry weather had taken a toll on bushes that received insufficient fertilizer after the ban. Plantation workers like Arulappan who hail predominantly from the island's Tamil minority are affected more than most as they own no land to provide a cushion against soaring food prices. Meanwhile, the government which promised several weeks back that the crisis won't last for even a week is struggling to secure enough money to pull the country out of the crisis. The IMF has given some positive signals but not without conditions. In such a scenario, observers believe that either the government will have to step down or will have to come up with a miraculous policy which not only restores people's faith in it but also help the country recover from the crisis that is appearing unending as of now. Time now for Asia this week, the stories from across the continent. The leaders of Japan and Thailand announced a new defense agreement as well as plans to upgrade their economic relations as Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida wrapped up the last leg of a three-nation tour of Southeast Asia. The agreement would facilitate the transfer of defense hardware and technology from Japan to Thailand, which has one of the region's biggest and most equipped armies and a long history of ties with the United States military. Prayuth said he discussed improvements in supply chains and the drafting of a five-year economic partnership with Japan, Thailand's biggest investor. Southeast Asia has for decades been an important region for Japan, hosting some of its biggest names in industry from infrastructure, engineering and industrial zones to the manufacturing of vehicles and electronics. The region remains a battleground between the United States, Japan's close ally and rival China, Southeast Asia's biggest trade partner. On his three-day trip, Kishida also visited Vietnam and Indonesia where Japanese firms maintain a large presence. The city of Baghdad was engulfed by a dust storm this week, latest in a series of storms that have become an increasingly common sight in the country. Dozens were hospitalized with respiratory issues as thick orange smog swept through the country, decreasing visibility and bringing air traffic to a halt for hours at the storm's peak. Iraqi residents believe that the cause of this storm is decreased rainfall and droughts. More than 90 people have been registered in the emergency ward of Sheikh Zayed Hospital. Many received oxygen and were subsequently discharged. Dust storms have become a more frequent occurrence in Iraq with experts blaming this on climate change and mismanagement of land and water. Yamaha Motor has introduced an electric scooter named EO1. The Japanese company also announced that they will start its demonstration in five Asian countries and Europe. EO1 is an electric bike that combines motorbike technology and EV technology which is used by Yamaha. The electric scooter is good for commuting short to medium distance. The electric drive makes it easy to move the motorcycle backward. The journalists who took a test drive were impressed by the performance. Its key point is the battery and charging facility. It gets fully charged in an hour. Battery's performance is based on temperature and circumstance. This demonstration experiment is held in temperate zone Japan and Europe, in subtropics Taiwan and in tropics Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia. 
The targeted countries will have a sharing service or B2B rental services. After the demonstration experiment, Yamaha Motor will obtain driving data of different countries. It will be considered for manufacturing and development of electric scooters and vehicles in future. Toyo so the venue for Tokyo Olympics has dramatically developed ever since the games were held here. Michino Terrace Toyosu was opened in April. It was constructed and organized by Japanese representative, general contractor Shimizu Corporation as the base of Toyosu Smart City. Michino Terrace has office area and hotel area. There are digital modern facilities like robots and autonomous driving vehicles. Shimizu Corporation is big general contractor and is continuously absorbing social necessity. It is the resource of expansion of business field. Basically, Japan's society is suffered by decreasing population and labor power. Shimizu Corporation is trying to solve it by its rich experience of construction and DX. Smart city is required to supply comfortable life and safe life. Shimizu Corporation analyzes a smart city has two aspects. One is vigorous economic activity including food culture derives from Toyosu Fresh Markets which has moved from Suki Market. Moving on. Millions of South Asian Muslims were jubilant as they marked the culmination of holy month of Ramadan and celebrated Eid al-Fitr. Festive fervor swept through India to Afghanistan and from Nepal to Sri Lanka. Muslim devotees gathered to pray at mosque across India as they celebrated Eid al-Fitr, the traditional Muslim holiday marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan. Devotees in several cities, including capital New Delhi, gathered in large numbers early in the morning to offer their prayers, after the coronavirus pandemic muted such celebrations for the past two years. Muslims embraced each other and exchanged Eid greetings after the prayers. ये बहुत ही लेकिन महत्वपूर्ण है क्योंकि हमें दो साल से ईद का कि नवास लेकिन का ये नहीं हुआ है फील नहीं हुआ कि मेहनत करने के लिए आना है और ऊपर से वेदर भी बहुत काफी अच्छा है अभी कल को बारिश था तो हमें सोचने आ गया कि ईद का में इस बार फिर भी नवास नहीं होंगे तो ऊपर आके इस बार से इंशाल्लाह बहुत बढ in Karachi city of Pakistan too, devotees celebrated Eid al-Fitr, the festival to mark the end of fasting month of Ramadan with mass prayers, new clothes and exchanging of greetings. Muslim worshippers gathered at local mosque and prayer grounds to offer prayers and listen to sermons, a far cry from the past two years when the South Asian nation imposed curbs to stop the spread of COVID-19. Residents in Islamabad and Lahore also thronged the local markets to shop for food, new outfits and shoes to celebrate the festival, but complained of rising cost of the items this year. I will say that we have to keep our friends with our friends and our friends. And we will pray that Allah will keep us in this country and keep us in this country. Another South Asian country, Bangladesh, was too drenched with this festivity. Mosque and special prayer grounds were filled with crowds. People were exchanging greetings and receiving as well. They gave blessings to their younger generations. People returned to their homes to celebrate the festival. Thousands of people scrambled to Dhaka's ferry terminals and train stations every year in the hopes of returning home. Around 20 million people live in Dhaka because of work and leave the capital to celebrate holidays with their families in their hometowns. तो टेस्ट में दारिया से टेनाज भी टिकट पाए नहीं, अकॉन होय तो सादे ऊपर उठ जेते हो भी बाह बीत रहे लोगों ने देखा है जा जेते पड़े। The celebration date for Eid varies from place to place and traditionally depends on the visibility of the crescent moon. During Ramadan period, Muslims abstain from eating and drinking during daylight hours for about 30 days. At the end of the fasting month, people drench with this festivity and celebrate with the religious holiday Eid al-Fitr. The festival of Eid al-Fitr basically symbolizes followers' willingness to give up some of their own bounties in order to strengthen ties of friendship and help those who are in need. 
With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.